So, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Isn't that an amazing statement? It's something I've always been curious about. So, today I, or this week, you know, as I was contemplating the, the workshop this afternoon, I thought, well, I should do something about our voices, you know, talk about our voices. And I thought, I know what I want to talk about. I want to talk about that passage. It's always fascinated me. I can't say that I really knew that much about it. It just always intrigued me. I thought, well, that's amazing. The Word was God. And, you know, I've talked here about breath, and I thought it has to be related to the vibration of our voices and the breath and all of that. So, so I started thinking about it, and, of course, I started reading. I have my little library. I went into my library, and I was like, let's see, maybe in this book, maybe in this book, maybe in that book. And I remembered a book where I'd read something about this passage many years ago called Original Blessing. Are you familiar with that book by Matthew Fox? Original Blessing. So he's one of those wonderful um, Catholic monks who got excommunicated for his ideas because he came up with this idea of original blessing rather than original sin. And the Catholics didn't think that that was something he should be preaching, I guess. So, so he was excommunicated, but he started his own thing. He's in California alive and well and doing wonderful things. And so I'm going to quote some of that book a little bit later on. But the official church doctrine for that passage has to do with Jesus. So a little bit later in the passage, it says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So the church doctrine says that that word is actually represented through Jesus, that Jesus was the word incarnate, and in some ways, the first, you know, the the last word of God was when Jesus came and, and spoke on the earth. The problem with that is that it actually wasn't formulated till the fourth century, which was quite some time after John wrote that passage about the word. And of course, it was a gradual evolution of doctrine that was brought about with a lot of um, complicated theological and political input. So as usual, here at Unity, we like to go look someplace else for, for the meaning. So Karen Armstrong, are any of you familiar with her book, A History of God, The 4,000-Year Quest, of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. So, an amazing book. And she suggests that we look at that passage through the perspective of political, not political, but um, scriptural writings and teachings that people at that time would have been influenced by. And she points to um, the idea of the word memra, which appears in the Hebrew scriptures known as the Lark Targums, that were being composed at that time. And it is used, it is also a word for word, and it's used to describe God's activity in the world. And the Hebrew word dabhar, which is the one that's found and that's almost always translated as word for us, is equated with the divine creative energy or wisdom, as some people refer to it. And it implies deeds and actions, not just words. So it's also about the activity of the world. And this points to the mystery of the creation of the world. So she also points, Karen Armstrong points to a passage in Proverbs that talks about this creative energy. Yahweh created me, wisdom, when his purpose first unfolded before the oldest of his works. From everlasting I was firmly set, from the beginning, before earth came into being. When he laid the foundations of the earth, I was at his side, a master craftsman, delighting him day after day, ever at play in his presence, at play everywhere in the world, delighting to be with the sons of men. So this is very joyful creation, and quite different from some kind of dogma that might have been come down as a final word. It implies this activity and this ongoing creative nature. Matthew Fox, that I mentioned a bit ago, says that this word, word, actually goes far beyond the human word. And he spent quite a bit of time talking in his book about how now, in this century, we're inundated with words. They're everywhere, the printed word, word processors, you know, everywhere. People are, we're very verbal, and it's, that's a very um, 
which one is it? Left brain activity. So very analytical. Um, but at the time, you know, there was a lot less noise and a lot less word from humans. So it was a more mystical time and there was more time for other types of, of sounds. So we encourage us to go beyond human words and to think about the many billion years of ongoing creation that can, constitutes God's speaking. So if you think about this, in this really amazing idea of God speaking the world into creation, as that idea of word about creation and about the creative power that there is in the universe. So this, of course, points back to Genesis. And these are the two places in the Bible where it says, in the beginning, right? So I actually found this beautiful passage um, it's Genesis, which I never found that exciting, to be honest. But think about it in these terms. I'm going to read this passage. This is just the beginning of the Bible, the Old Testament. Um, and it's really, really wondrous when you think about it from this perspective of joyful creative energy. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning one day. Then God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. God made the expanse and separated the waters which were below the expanse from the waters which were above the expanse, and it was so. God called the expanse heaven. And there was evening and there was morning, a second day. Then God said, let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And it goes on and on, and then God said, and something manifested, and then God said, and something else manifested. So it's, it's really a beautiful story, this beautiful, mystical story about that idea of speaking something into creation that's really powerful. So the other book that I referred to a lot was this book by Paramahansa Yogananda, wonderful yogi, called The Yoga of Jesus, which I've had for quite a while and hadn't really cracked open, but it's an amazing book. And he died in 1956, but it's replete with some publisher's notes that kind of um, give some more input from the decades since he died. So in his book, he defines word in this context as God's intelligent cosmic vibration and relates it to the wisdom of the rishis. So the rishis, this word rishi comes from the word drish, which is to see. So the rishis were said to have such clear vision that they could understand the vibrations of the universe, which came as mantras. So even those that didn't seem to have meaning, the rishis were able to understand and translate into human form. And the, the kind of classic mantra, Om, is actually said to contain all the vibrations of the universe within it. And that's something that we're going to explore this afternoon, that particular sound. So he says, all creation is nothing but spirit seemingly and temporarily diversified by spirit's creative vibratory activity. And I'll just read a little bit that he goes on to say in his book. Word means intelligent vibration, intelligent energy going forth from God. Any utterance of a word such as flower expressed by an intelligent being consists of sound energy or vibration plus thought which imbues that vibration with intelligent meaning. Likewise, the word, with a capital W, that is the beginning and source of all created substances is cosmic vibration, imbued with cosmic intelligence. And he actually says this cosmic vibration is what is meant by Holy Ghost. 
So holy implies the sacred, and ghost implies this mysticism around it. And then he says it's imbued with cosmic intelligence, which he says is Christ consciousness, which we talk about a lot in unity. So thought of matter, energy of which matter is composed, matter itself, all things are but the differently vibrating thoughts of the spirit. So in this sense, cosmic vibration is the same as Holy Ghost, is the same as Om, is the same as Amen. And Amen actually just means, and so it is, so be it. So it's just recognizing the power of what is and the beauty of what is. So Yogananda interprets this passage from John 1 as, following, as follows. In the beginning was the Word. The Word existed from the very beginning of creation, God's first manifestation in bringing forth the universe. And the Word was with God, imbued with God's reflected intelligence or Christ consciousness. And the Word was God, vibrations of his own one being. I love how that ties in with our reading today, the daily passage, and with Unity's whole idea about there being one energy. This divine creative energy, of course, extends to all of creation. It isn't just being expressed in Jesus. It's being expressed in each and every one of us, but it's also being expressed in everything, all of creation. So trees, rocks, mountains, everything out there is a divine expression of God. Meister Eckhart, one of my very favorite Christ Christian mystics, German theologian, says every creature is a word of God. And Fox says, Matthew Fox, all of creation contains the living wisdom of God, and all of it, it, all of it is for all of us. There is one flow, one divine word, one creative energy flowing through all things, all time, and all space. So all of that is fascinating to me. I found all of it really exciting. And then I read a little publisher's note, one page note in this book, about the most recent findings of theoretical physicists, which blew my mind. And if any of you have been looking at my Facebook posts in the last couple of days, you'll see that. I mean, literally when I read this thing, I had to stop and I was just like in awe of the whole idea. So do any of you know about superstring theory? Oh, somebody does. Okay, you can correct me if I say this wrong, because I am not a scientist. It's a big hole in my education, but I'm excited to learn more about it now. So super string theory says, well, first they came up with string theory, which says that everything, like the most minute particle, I don't even know if particle is the right word, but the my, my most minute substance are these little string loops. And the way, as they vibrate, they create neutrons and protons and electrons and all the things that make up the substance of the world. So in the beginning, they thought these little string loops were actually of different substances to create, you know, that's why you had neutrons as opposed to electrons as opposed to whatever other ONS there are. <laughs> so you can see I'm very technical about all of this. So, um, but recently, they've discovered that the stuff of them all is the same. Now, this substance is one billion, billion times smaller than the nucleus of an atom. So we're talking super, super microscopic, like ultra microscopic. But what's fascinating and amazing to me is that they're saying that everything, the stuff of all of these things is exactly the same. The reason it manifests differently is simply how it's vibrating. So like the string of a violin, it vibrates in different ways and creates individual unique sounds. So of course, I loved that analogy. Um, but I mean, that's amazing. That means not only we are we in some kind of abstract, energetic way the same, it means physically we're all from the same 
stuff. And we're all from the same stuff as the trees outside and the animals and the rocks and these chairs and the carpet and the ceiling. I mean, that is mind-blowing to me. And totally goes back to this idea of there being one energy and that that one energy is in each and every one of us, that we are an expression of it, and as we move through our lives, we are expressing it. So the final... Um, line in here about that said, at the ultramicroscopic level, the universe would be akin to a string symphony vibrating matter into existence. Isn't that beautiful? I just love it. We were in yoga class the other day, and the teacher said, okay, now we've done something challenging. I don't remember what it was. And she said, okay, now compose yourself. Which, you know, to me means like calm down. I think that's how she meant it. Everybody just bring yourself back together. And as a musician, suddenly, I mean, I'd heard that word many times before, but suddenly I was like, oh my gosh, compose myself. Compose myself. Come, com, C-O-M, means with. Pose comes from posture, which actually also is an attitude. So with a certain attitude, with intention, I am going to bring myself, to make of myself a beautiful, harmonious symphony. That's what it means to really compose yourself, to bring yourself into harmony in these multiple layers of vibration, which so reflects this super string theory and everything that Yogananda is saying and Meister Eckhart is saying and the rishis of you know thousands of years ago from India were saying. So I love that it brings all this together. In the West, we're just now starting to catch up. And of course, this super string theory is a theory that's controversial because people don't like to believe that the earth is round and things like that. So anyway, I was just blown away when I, when I came across that. So Fox quotes geologist Thomas Berry as saying, the universe is the primary revelation of the divine, the primary scripture. This idea that nature is a sacrament. Nature is a teacher, just as we are all teachers to each other. We can look to sacred texts, of course. We can look to wise people, of course. But nature is also right there waiting to teach us. And he asks, are we listening? Are we awake? Are we paying attention to all those vibrations that are around us and that are coming out of us? Are we even awake to our own vibration and to the wisdom that we hold within us? So, I sent the title for the talk, Freeing the Voice Within, and later I thought it really should have been The Power of Your Authentic Voice, because that's what this is telling us. This is telling us that each of us has this immense capacity to create, and not just with our words, but even with our thoughts, because as we form the thoughts, that too becomes a vibration. So we are all changing the world every minute of every day for better or worse. So as your mother maybe said, mind your thoughts and mind your actions. So I wanted to share just a couple of healing stories that I know of. And I thought about the throat chakra, which is um, said to be the center of expression, but also the center of purification and the center of transformation. And there's this beautiful story in, um, Indian mythology that talks about a time when the devas, these are the shining ones, kind of like angels, are, and the gods are all out there, and they're churning this milk of the universe, and they're hoping to come up with something called amrita, which is this beautiful nectar of you know, everlasting life. Well, as they churn, instead what happens is this substance called halahala is created, and halahala is extremely toxic. It contains all the negative energy of the world. It's very dangerous. And before you know it, all the devas and different gods are starting to get sick and fall, and there's a big crisis going on. So they go to Brahma, the creator, and say, you know, what are we going to do? And he says, well, I think you need to go to Shiva, who is known as the destroyer, and also the one that's about dissolution, letting things pass on. And so Shiva took this substance, hala hala, and drank it. He was going to dispose of it by drinking it. And his wife, when his wife saw that, was like very proud of him, but at the same time didn't want him to die. So she went and 
stopped it in his throat. And there in his throat, it was transformed into Amrita, into this nectar of everlasting life. So it's a beautiful, a beautiful symbology of how through our throats, this center of expression, we can change something that appears to be negative, appears to be a crisis, and make it an opportunity. And there's a word, I think it's kiki, I think it's Hawaiian, that actually has both of those connotations. Crisis also is, is contained in that word as well as opportunity. So I've had an experience like this myself, actually, with my voice, actually, about my voice. I, I used to have a very soft voice, and my voice can still be soft. And I had trouble projecting when I was singing. And I was at a singing workshop with one of these um, you know, family singers. They didn't have any kind of training, but they just had grown up singing. And I asked that question, how can I project my voice? And they said, this woman, that's the only question I asked. I hadn't talked to her before. And she just looked at me and she said, I can see that you're a soft person and you should allow your voice to be soft. It was the most beautiful thing anybody could have said to me. I didn't need to do anything but let my voice be what it was. So that's what I started doing. I also discovered microphones in the meantime, which was a beautiful thing. <laughs> And I still actually much prefer to sing into a microphone because I can allow my voice to get very soft and people can still hear it. So I can, you know, use the full range. But what I've discovered is that even when I'm singing a soft song, I no longer have any trouble projecting. So actually by allowing myself to be who I was, my voice became strong. Not by trying to make it strong, not by trying to do anything, by allowing myself to be who I was. And that's a very powerful thing. I also heard of this amazing story of a tribe, I think it was in New Guinea. Um, some anthropologists discovered a tribe that had not been exposed to civilization, and they had an amazing rate of well-being. There just wasn't any illness among them. And so they started studying to try to figure out, did they, you know, what did they do? Did they have some kind of medicinal practices? Did they have medicine men? You know, what did they do? Well, it turns out this is what they did. When somebody had an ailment, whether it was physical, mental, psychological, whatever it was, they brought the individual to a place and sat them in, a, in the center, and all the village would sit around this individual. And the head of the village would ask them, what have you not said? And they would wait. Maybe hours, maybe days. They would just wait for this person to speak whatever it was they had not said. That's it. That's all they did. So if you think yourself about how often, I mean, obviously there are times when it's better to be quiet. There are times when what we need to say isn't something that's useful or helpful or positive. But a lot of times we have something that's really important to us that we're not saying. We're not expressing what is innermost and what is our truth inside, the divine truth and creation that's within us. We're not speaking. And that is essential. So I had this, this experience recently, too. It was about, actually, I've had some things go on recently that had to do with speaking and wondering, you know, like when I'm doing musical presentations, if I should just be doing my music and not talking. And I've kind of gotten these messages that say, actually, you should say what comes up to you at that time. It's a, as much as, it's as important as the music is. And just let spirit guide you. So that's what I've been doing. And I've had these experiences that I, I've, I've shared them with a few people and they say they're like kundalini experiences, that creative energy that comes up from your root and comes up through your body. And some of them have actually been very, very powerful. And one time, um, it was like golden liquid that came up from my core and came up through my body and filled my whole entire body like all through my extremities with this golden liquid and you know, didn't go beyond my extremities, just went into my extremities, but then it poured out my mouth as golden liquid. And I'd been having these other experiences at the same time of you know, these messages about speaking. So, so that was to me also very powerful. It's like, oh, oh, okay. That whole idea of allowing our voices to be free is so very important. So, what we find is that this relates to the whole creative flow. 
Fox quoted wisdom scholar Gerhard von Rad as saying, what is required is a surrender of man to the glory of existence, a falling in love with what is, with existence itself. Meister Eckhart calls this the isness is God. So we, we recover this true mystical nature of Genesis, of God speaking creation into existence, of light and dark and sun and moon. And again, Meister Eckhart says, God is a great underground river that no one can dam up and no one can stop. So that is how disease occurs within us, when we dam up our rivers, when we don't allow our true voice in whatever expression that is. It might not actually be by speaking. It might be by painting or by doing dancing or something else. That's also your voice. And when we don't allow that expression, we are damming up this river of creation. And so then healing can't occur. And when we open up that flow, healing occurs. And that is also what this afternoon's workshop is about, is some tools for how to start doing that and to start doing it with others because you get this great resonance going on. So Fox says our spiritual task is that we get out of the way of the truly energetic creative word of God long enough that we might be filled with it and go about our task of healing, celebrating, and co-creating. For Dabhar wishes to be incarnate in us. Then we become one with the word, the divine creative energy. And I think this is the true meaning of John 1.1. 1, 1. The true incarnation of the word, not just Jesus, but all of creation, including each and every one of us. So I'm going to close with reading a bit from Fox. And I'm going to start by his kind of recreating of that passage. In the beginning was the creative energy. The creative energy was with God, and the creative energy was God. It was with God in the beginning, and through it all things came to be. A creation-centered person is sensitive and aware, alive and awake to the ever-flowing, ever-green unfolding of the divine Dabhar. For such a per person, creation itself constitutes the primary sacrament. Creation is as ongoing as we are, as vast as our experience of it. It is in us and we in it. It is us and far beyond us. Humanity constitutes a uniquely sacramental receptacle for God's holy dabhar, as Meister Eckhart testifies. Everything which God created millions of years ago, and everything which will be created by God after millions of years, if the world lasts that long, God is creating all that in the innermost and deepest realms of the human soul. Everything of the past and everything of the present and everything of the future, God creates in the innermost realms of the soul. And so it is.